Well, you've had a chance to uh, hear from Charlie and uh, Dr. James Lindsay, and then uh, to my far right is Michael O'Fallon. Uh, yeah, well, one person knows him. Now I have more people know him. Michael, I, if, if I tried to describe all the things you've accomplished, I would butcher it. Um, and also, we take so much time that we'd run out of time. Can you just share with everyone who you are so it just makes it easier and make, and make them endeared to you because they're a pretty tough crowd. <sighs> Well, uh, I'm Michael Fallon. I received Christ back when, in 1996 in a Bible study in Galatians. Uh, and the pastor at the time that was teaching uh, was a graduate of Dallas Theological Seminary. His name's Joe Hancock. His brother is actually John Lee Hancock, who was the director of The Blind Side. So a little bit of tie-in here with some other folks. Um, but I came out of Catholicism and came into things and began to teach after a few years, became very involved in apologetics, uh, started to uh, sponsor uh, some, some different debates along the way, theological debates between different folks, especially between Islam and Christianity, uh, between those that are atheists in Christianity and so forth. But we would always try to make sure that we are doing things in a friendly way, in a scholastic way, being able to talk about things. I have a company that uh, I do tours and travel and cruises and things for Christian organizations, for educational organizations, for political organizations. But along the way, uh, I picked up some clients that, uh, let's just say, are involved with things like the World Economic Forum, the Council on Foreign Relations and others. And, and in that time period, um, I was able to hear some things and to be in the room with a few things were being said and then would take those things and be able to take them to their logical conclusions and then saw how some of these things were starting to be infused within the church uh, because those folks were as well looking for ways to have connections with folks that were in especially the larger denominations, uh, the Southern Baptist Convention, the PCA, especially with the Pentecostal organizations and so forth and denominations. And so I started an organization called Sovereign Nations back in 2017 to start taking on the issues of critical race theory, intersectionality, and other things that were coming into the church, but also coming in across all of culture. And so that led into the statement of social justice in the gospel back in 2018. And then as well, I met Dr. James Lindsay. Uh, I won't say how I met him. I was uh, actually in a, leading a tour in Ireland and uh, was just getting out of the shower. I had another lecture running from Dr. Jordan Peterson. And the next one that came, in, came up was, was James Lindsay talking about, is intersectionality a new religion? And so I got to know Dr. Lindsay. He and I have partnered in a few things and uh, began new discourses. And that's Dr. Lindsay's organization. And so that's where most of, of you, I think, know me through the causes of things, my podcasts, and public occurrences, both foreign and domestic at Sovereign Nations. Good job, Michael. I, I, uh, when I had first met you, I thought you were his manager. Forgive me, and I didn't, I knew you did. Nobody tours manages and the like. James Lindsay. Yeah. <laughs> but but when, you spoke, when you spoke at our church, I was blown away, and that was one of the greatest events to this day. Uh, folks have spoken about you, spoken about uh, James, and it, it was so insightful and transformative for so many people. All right, so the two of you are tasked with uh, a, a large responsibility. First of all, uh, Dr. Lindsay, but I call you James because you're my buddy. Um, I, I, I want you to talk about this pagan religion um, and how they're attempting to make it like Christianity. And then uh, I'm going to throw it over to you, Michael, and I want you, because you alluded to the World Economic Forum and how they're implementing this and what the goal is so that folks can be prepared and be aware. So, James, take it. Yeah, thanks, Rob. And uh, So Mike said that his introduction to me was listening to a video that I, was, I did. It was recorded in February of 2018, and the panel discussion was whether or not intersectionality constitutes a religion, and we were arguing that, yes, it does. Uh, so this is something that I've been pursuing for a little while, um, actually maybe as early as 2013 or 14. I suspected whatever was going on in woke, kind of way ahead of anybody even calling it woke, was very religious in nature. I didn't really understand it. Obviously this morning with Charlie I talked about Gnosticism and these ancient heresies and kind of exposed the religious roots. I want to get a little, unfortunately, technical with you and not in the theologically technical way, I want to take a step back because I think that this is actually relevant because we're Americans as well. I want to talk about how the Supreme Court recognizes something as religious or not for Establishment Clause purposes because it, it lays it bare. As soon as I tell you the actual definition, which was summarized by a legal theorist named Ben Clements in 1999, 
He laid out an argument that said that he looked at all of the case law, all of the establishment case law that hit the Supreme Court, and summarized what is it that constitutes a religion according to what, everything the Supreme Court has decided on, which includes deciding that secular humanism is a religion, deciding that communism is not a religion, which is a little bit ironic because they're the same thing. And what the three qualifications are, and you'll see immediately that, that woke constitutes a religion or that Marxism constitutes a religion, the three qualifications are that it's a comprehensive system of belief and practice, that's number one, that, so this comes number two, answers fundamental questions about the world and man's role in it, such that three, it gives rise to duties of conscience. Okay, so if it is a comprehensive system of belief and practice, and it explains what the meaning and purpose of life is, and it gives rise to you having to act upon that explanation, then according to the Supreme Court's jurisprudence throughout the entire history of the United States, it meets the definition legally as a religious practice for constitutional law purposes. It has nothing to do with whether you guys want to recognize it as a faith or a religion or a cult or a good thing or a bad thing. It has nothing to do with it. This is just straight up how the Supreme Court rules on this. And it's very obvious that it meets these qualifications. There are reams and reams of theory, thousands of pages of theory, explaining a comprehensive system of belief about how the world is organized into oppressors versus oppressed, which I characterized earlier as actually being explicitly cult religious in that it recreates Gnosticism in the social spiritual sphere instead of the transcendental spiritual sphere. It obviously is also a, a system of practice. It doesn't have like the normal kind of liturgy that you guys might be used to, but you're gonna do activism. You're going to go and show up and protest. You're gonna get active in your community. You're gonna do community organizing, which creates a de facto church. And the, the organized community activist groups become the equivalent of a church. Does it answer f questions about the world and man's role in it? Yes, it says that the world operates according to so-called dialectical principles and that these touch all aspects of life and that life is ultimately socially constructed and man's role in it is to understand that he is a historical agent who can seize the means of production of society and thus of mankind and transform it to what its alleged intended end is going to be. So it even has an eschatology baked in that when we get this right finally we enter into the promised land or the, the created the, the, the bogus created kingdom of God. And this gives rise to duties of conscience. You have to call people out. You have to cancel. You have to speak up. You have to do better. You have to do the work. Or in kind of the Chinese, you have to struggle your friends, put them through struggle sessions. You have to criticize and enter into self-criticism. You have to do religious reflection upon whether or not you're holding to the teachings of the religion. And then you must put that into praxis. You must take action. There must be activism connected to this. So it absolutely meets the definition in a very technical sense. That it's a Gnostic theology that was cooked up by Hegel and made material by Marx is also very historically easy to, to characterize. So what is a theology? So let's go more philosophical and less legally technical. What is, a, what is a, a, a theology? Well, a theology is a science of sciences in a sense. It's something that binds all the sciences together and orients them toward a sense of the divine. So what is the divine in this particular religion? Well, it's man himself. So if you take man, as Karl Marx said in his, his critique of, of Hegel, and he says that what you're going to do is erect man as his own true son that he orbits around himself. Or if you look at where he writes in the Economic and Philosophic Manuscripts and says that man is the creator of man and man is where man comes from and man is man's past and future, then what you can actually tell is that they've created a religion where they've taken basically everything that you have out of Christianity, flipped it upside down, put man himself as the creator role and turned every single one of the virtues and vices upside down. Down to the point where I was just listening to, to Bill Federer, who I, I got that right, I didn't mix him up with the tennis player, right? Okay, so I was just listening to him talking, and I know Rob mentioned it last night about tacit consent. It's from Numbers 30 is what he said, and what you said. Look at that, I remember it even. And so this idea is instrumental to their religion. Have you noticed that the, that the, the global people tend to tell you what they're going to do before they do it? That's because as a religious practice, they believe that they can't violate your consent. So they tell you what they're going to do, and when you don't say no, they do it yep. because you've consented to it. This is actually for, not for your average woke kid on a college campus or your average woke kid showing up to your church asking questions or protesting or whatever they do. 
This is for the guys at the top that really, really believe in what this is all about, that have an intention to transform the world into what they believe it's intended to be, to complete man and nature according to their designs, to make man truly social man or sustainable man or inclusive man or whatever the buzzword is that they attach to it. They believe that they can't do these things to you until they tell you they're going to do them and you say nothing. Which, by the way, should be a very encouraging thing for you because it means you only have to do one thing to drive out them, their, their demon, their demonic influences. Say no. That's all it takes. You will not do this to us. We will not consent. We do not go along. You can't have our children. You can't have our society. You can't have our schools. You may not have our churches. That's all you have to say. Michael, the implementation of this pagan religion, this idea of World Economic Forum, uh, we got Yuval Hutari and you got Klaus Schwab. A lot of folks just think, oh, no, no, that's conspiracy. Yet it's printable. You can download the PDF. Everything that they're doing, like you're saying, they're telegraphing. Um, and, and for us to be ignorant is not acceptable. We're to study to show ourselves approved unto God. Workmen need not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So, Michael, how is this being implemented um, on, a, on a global level, and, and how should we as shepherds of the body of Christ be made aware and be vigilant? Well, it starts back really in the 1960s at the start or in, around the process of Vatican II with a man by the name of Dom Helder Camara, and it would be the Synod of the Catacombs. There's a couple of other names that they would give to it, where they basically had a number of bishops and cardinals that agreed to meet uh, in the catacombs of Rome, where they would make a pact to change the actual mission of the Roman Catholic Church. Um, Dom Helder Camara was called the Red Bishop of Recife, Recife, Brazil. That's also where, if you heard James earlier talking about Paulo Ferreri and Pedagogy of the Oppressed, uh, Paulo Ferreri was from Recife, Brazil. Isn't that interesting? So you have Dom Helder Camara, who basically was a man in the 1930s who was involved with something called Intergalismo, or Intergalism, in Brazil. Uh, which then, as he advanced through life and became a bishop and was part of the Roman Catholic Church in Brazil, was really leading the Roman Catholic Church in that area of Recife, uh, really brought a system that kind of blended a little bit more socialism in a national socialist kind of model. Well, this man mentored some people. He mentored the current pope of the Roman Catholic Church, but he also mentored somebody else, Klaus Schwab. And so Klaus Schwab had this gentleman come and speak at really at one of the first meetings of the World Economic Forum in 1974. Uh, this model, which would be corporate governance and then state governance, which you would call corporate state governance what? The public-private partnership is called corporatism or fascism. And so what you do is you add a moral component to that of religion. And it, it can be any religion that they want. And with the World Economic Forum, of course, they're coming after Christianity. They're wanting to make sure that they can involve Christianity with this thing. But they're doing the same thing with Muslims. They're doing the same thing with Buddhists. They're doing the same things with every religion right now, trying to basically control that moral aspect of the third leg of the stool, because the stool can't just stand up on two legs. It needs a third leg. So what happens is that then this becomes part of something that begins to be phased in. They start in inviting over some higher end uh, pastors and theologians and leaders in different denominations and evangelicalism. Coming over to Davos at the World Economic Forum. Coming over and being a part of the Council on Foreign Relations. Start helping us to explain to people why we need open borders. Why our old, you know, our old system of immigration is fixed, is, is broken and needs to be fixed. And the way that it needs to be fixed is by opening up the borders. Uh, by being able to start to to tell people that things like socialism and a more equitable way of doing economy needs to be something that we need to bring in. And as well, we have a problem with oppression with people that are of different ethnicities, and we have a problem with whiteness. And when they say whiteness, they always mean capitalism, by the way. So if you can write this down real quick, there is a document you need to look up today. It's called The Role of Faith in Systemic Global Challenges. It's from the World Economic Forum. It was composed by several different members of the World Economic Forum. The lead person, of course, was James Riotti of Lippo Group. And so if you take a look at that doc document, as Dr. Lindsay was just referring to earlier, it's a dialectical process. It's saying problem. The problem is, is that Christians are too conservative or that Christians, you know, they, they embrace capitalism. They don't really see another way of doing things. Or Christians are afraid of things like vaccines. They actually were saying this in the document. So that's the problem. We need to have them react in a different way. 
We need to make sure that we're having the, the faith leaders of churches and religions help them to see that really they need to trust the government and they need to trust their technocratic overlords to be able to help them into a new way of doing things. And of course, the solution is by turning over all of your rights and all of your liberties and so forth to some sort of, if you will, a governmental structure or into the faith leaders themselves who are now partners with the government. That's how this happens. And it happens as well with pastors and leaders and so forth who sit down at meetings over dinners and so forth, or maybe they're playing golf with someone saying, you know what, there's going to be a change coming and there's nothing you can do to stop it. So either you can come along with us and we'll make life very good for you, believe me, financially and so forth, we'll make sure that big things happen for you. But if you go against it, you're going to get the stick. Things are going to be bad for you. So don't oppose us. So all of a sudden you have pastors and leaders all over the nation and as well in every denomination saying, well, we really need to take a look at the problem of social justice. And all of a sudden you're infusing in critical race theory. All of a sudden you're infusing in ideas like intersectionality. All of a sudden they're saying, well, we need to resist guys like Donald Trump. We don't need a man like that in the White House, but what we really need is Hillary Clinton or Joe Biden. You see how this happens. And so all of a sudden you have pastors that are falling into this game. And it can happen on both sides of the aisle, by the way. And what you need to do is be what? Bereans. Okay? There is a personal responsibility for you as well. Okay? And you need to hold your pastors accountable. And where you could really see that dividing line, I think, was in the beginning of COVID. And so you had Rob McCoy, who said, no, you know what? We're not shutting down. We're going to fine you a million dollars. Well, we're not shutting down. We're going to fine you three million dollars. Well, we're not showing down. We're not shutting down. And that's how you start to take the stand. And this is how you take the stand as now all of these folks are going to be starting to tell you, you know, really our system of capitalism isn't working right now. You see the dollar and the inflation. We need to take a look. It's because you're breaking it. You're breaking it. No, we need to stay with freedom, with liberty, and liberty of conscience and freedom of religion. That's what we need. Because with freedom of religion, there's some people running around right now saying, we need one religion in America. Really? We do? What religion is that? And who's in charge? No, no, no. Freedom. You need to make sure that you have liberty. You know, liberty. There's pastors in here that have completely different theological convictions, right? I know. Some of you have come up to me and talked to me. You know, you know I mean, uh, Rob's, you know, Rob and I have some different uh, views on soteriology, but I love this man. And what we both actually support is liberty of that conviction in terms of what we believe the Bible teaches. And if you don't have that, you have tyranny. Good word. Is there something you want to add? Tie these things? So all my weird abstract stuff and all of his very technical, uh, practical stuff are the same thing, by the way. So we have people running around saying we need one religion in this country, right? And of course, which one? Who's in charge of this? That sounds great, right? No, this is not so good. But we also have this idea at the... Uh, at, at the, in the catacombs with the Roman Catholic meeting and they're trying to come up with a new plan for faith and it gets all ecumenical. You have the World Council of Churches set up in Geneva. They're all part of this. World, Paulo Ferreri studies there for 10 years. Uh, the same guy I mentioned, the Marxist educator who's figured out the program to transform education in the both seminaries and, and the education system. And it turns out that there is one religion. If you believe in Hermeticism, which is one of these Gnostic heresies, they believe that there's just one religion. It's called Hermeticism. And that all religions, all philosophies, all sciences are all part of the exact same theology. There's one master theology. It turns out it's theirs. How convenient. And that is called, ultimately, the Prisca Theologia, which is a very fancy Latin phrase that means the ancient theology or the ancient faith, which we're also starting to hear our politicians call, we need to go back to our ancient faith. What, that's scary because that's a very important point that they believe that it's not that, I mean, I've, I've read the gospel, right? I am the way, the truth, and the life. There is no way but through me, right? I get the Christians are pretty exclusive in this. So you guys aren't Hindu and you guys aren't Buddhist and you guys aren't whatever else. You're not secular philosophers. You're not these things. But in the ancient faith, in the Prisca Theologia, you are. There's one diamond of faith, and each one of the faces looks different. One's Christianity, one's Buddhism, one's Islam. One is German idealism. One of them is French romanticism. 
These are all just faces on a single diamond. So they are fundamentally anti-Christian. They are fundamentally rejecting the central claim of Christianity. And what they're trying to bring you into is believing, hey, but guess what? You know your Christianity pretty well, but did you know you can know it better? You can know it deeper. God hath not said, <laughs> in other words. What they're saying is we have the secret gnosis about what real religion is, and if you get, on our, get into our cult, basically, we're going to take you along the way. And so this is the thing that they were meeting to figure out how to implement, meeting to figure out how to package up and sell to Protestants, package up and sell to Catholics, package up and sell to Muslims, package up and sell in the secular academy. These are the things that they were trying to figure out how to package up because they want one religion— that's their religion that is this transformational, anti-Christianity, upside-down, satanic religion of transforming the world to what they think it's supposed to be. Wow. Uh, I, I'm sitting here supposed to be moderating, and I forgot that I'm doing that. <laughs> I, I just have the best seat in the house. That's it. James, uh, we're, we're limited on time, but um, you, you, you alluded to what C.S. Lewis called the trilemma uh, when he— when, when Jesus spoke of himself, I am the way, the truth, the life, I and no other, it's exclusive. Um, and, and your admission um, in our friendship when you first claimed to be an atheist and then you declared you believed in absolute truth, um, and it, so that's agnosis without knowledge. I know that there's a, a supreme truth being, I just don't know who they are. You haven't figured that out yet. And, and like, Michael and I both want you to know it's Jesus. <clears throat> yeah. And we've had long conversations, and you're wondering, what is, what is a, a, an agnostic doing, headlining, as Charlie had alluded to earlier? Um, and, and I've watched as I've been with you a number of people coming up and, and what we call in Christianity witnessing to you. Uh, and they, it's almost like, well, Rob obviously can't do it, and neither can Charlie. <laughs> so, <yeah. clears throat> so the gunslinger comes in, and yeah. I, I, I told you earlier um, the sincerity of you as a friend. Yes. When, when I became a Christian, the man who discipled me through the Navigator study a uh, humble farmer, married, uh, four kids, took me through the Navigator study, led me to Christ. I got my foundation. That man would later be responsible for sleeping with my fiance, impregnating her. And, and you look at that and you think that if there's ever a reason to give up on Christianity, that would be one of them. But I realized he isn't any worse than I am. And God didn't let me down, man did. And, and in this time where the more you step into events like this, you're getting beat up on both sides. And, um, but there's, there's the sincerity in what you're looking for. Yes. And I never gave up. And I came to see a, a Christianity that, that was real and precious to me that has never forsaken me. And, and then the Lord brought into my life a woman who's just remarkable, 33 years of marriage, and she is the greatest gift God could have ever given me. And share with the folks, if you would, because they, they want to hear about you, and, and everyone's curious. Share with the folks your, your most heartwarming experience thus far of what you would call sincere Christianity or something that's touched you. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Rob. Um, it's going to sound a little campy to say this or cheesy, I guess, or whatever, but we're actually living in it in th this present moment. It's not the first time. Uh, you invited me to come to the pastor's conference last uh, summer, last fall, whatever that was. That was wonderful. We're at this pastor summit now. This is wonderful. And there's been a couple of times that I've been invited to these kinds of events. And it turns out the internet is a little different than people. <laughs> It's diametrically opposed to what my actual experience is. So I'll tell you the truth. You don't even know this yet. Michael knows. He can, he can back me up. I called him the other day. About two days ago, I almost backed out of this. I wasn't going to come. 
I got so beat up, so trashed by these Christians, I feel like I had to humiliate myself to sit in front of a group of Christians, people calling themselves Christians, I say, they've been so vicious to me for a week that I feel like I had to humiliate myself to sit in a room and I'm not going to humiliate myself. And then, you know what, I said, no, and I'm not going to do that. They want me to quit, so I'm not going to quit. That's obviously what you have to do when people are trying to bully you into quitting. So I show up, and yet again, another event, whether it's a Turning Point USA event, whether it's a TPUSA faith event, whether it's one of these pastors, some very specifically, nothing but warmth, welcome, genuine witness, nothing but acceptance, the exact opposite of what I see on the internet. We love you, James. We really do.